Good evening. You need to know a little bit about the two gentlemen to my left. Suresh Menon always says that he stumbled into journalism. You can't hear? Can you hear now? Perfect. So Suresh says that he stumbled into journalism and the world of journalism, particularly sports journalism, but not exclusively, is very fortunate that he never got up again. Uh, if you printed out everything that he has written about cricket and about sport, you could fill this library with some to spare. He's written two books on two of my favorite cricketers, Mansoor Ali Khan Patardi and Bishan Singh Bedi. Uh, and he has written a book about books, about reading, about books. That's Suresh. Didi Devangshu Dutta, we're friends, I've gotten used to calling him Didi. I'll probably keep doing that throughout the session, don't mind me. Uh, Devangshu Dutta is a columnist, he's an editor, he's a world class chess player, ditto a bridge player. Uh, listing all his accomplishments would take most of the session, so I'll leave it at that. Um, we are told to make this free flowing. So first thing we're doing is we're walking away from the subject of what our place in this world is as writers or columnists and looking at the place of books in this world. Um, many ways of looking at it, I'll just give you one. As a society, we've forgotten the art of conversation. And I don't mean Hi, how are you, and what did you make of the movie you saw last night? I'm talking about conversations about substantive issues. Why can't we talk to one another? Because we live in a polarized world. Polarization means taking sides. I've picked my side, you've picked yours. A great deal of thought didn't go into my picking my side. It just felt like the good side to be, or the cool side to be, or whatever. Now when I talk to you, and you're from the other side, you give me, you use reason, you use logic, you use argument to say that I'm wrong. What happens is that I feel diminished. I feel, I feel small, I feel like I made the wrong choice and I can't admit it because my ego is too fragile for that. So what am I left with? I'm left with abuse. And we've become very creative about abuse. Words that were formerly innocuous are now forms of abuse. Uh, for example, if somebody calls me an intellectual with or without the pseudo prefix, I feel dirty somehow, like I have to go have a shower. But that's the world that we've come to, where we can't talk to one another. We can't discuss, we can't debate, and we can't walk away knowing there is no right and wrong side. The Counter to that is a book, because the big advantage is I can engage with it in my private space. I can accept all of it, I can reject all of it, I can take parts of it and fold it into my worldview, but it's all happening in privacy, and I can still walk away feeling not so low. That's one way of looking at the world of books. I want to turn it over to Suresh, uh, who, like I said, he's written a book about reading and about books. And uh, Suresh, open-ended question, basically about where you see the ro role of books in this world and, and your own uh, experiences as a reader, the kind of books that have shaped you, all of that. Well, I think I I'm far more positive than uh, most writers, and partly because I'm so young, I can afford to be positive. It's also the fact that books will always remain with us what might change is the form. You might not have the physical book, you might be, you know, the uh, electronic version of it, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you're an e-reader, Kindle reader, or you read off a book. But books, books will survive. I mean, books have survived since, you know, they, they were carved on stone. And so there's no reason why it shouldn't survive the electronic age. Books will survive, and hopefully the ones that survive will be the good books. But that's a whole uh, different conversation. Uh, my, my own sort of, uh, I've, I've always been a books person. I mean, from a very young age, I was always reading. I was reading when I was having breakfast. I was ha reading when I was having lunch. I was reading when I had dinner. 
Uh, and, and to their credit, my parents didn't actually mind. They, in fact, encouraged me, and they actually bought me books. So it was important for me, in my case, that uh, I grew up in a sort of, not, a, not in a book's atmosphere in the sense that there were a lot of books in the house. Most of the books in the house were mine. I mean, Dad had some technical books, and uh, Mom read a lot in Malayalam, which I'm uh, ashamed to say I, I cannot do. Uh, but, but books were always a part of that. And I think it's a, that's, that's an important uh, sort of introduction to books for a child. I mean, my son was a reader at roughly the same age, and he read, he read books for much the same reason, because he was surrounded by books in his house. And that's, that's how it starts. It starts at that age. And, and books have shaped me right through in, in whatever I have done uh, in my life. You said it has shaped you. Has it, uh, I mean, would you want to attribute it to the certain types of books or, or the books that you read at a certain age or even, no, I'll stop there. No, what I meant was, I think what I meant was that uh, at a particular stage in my life, a particular book might have appealed to me, because, not, not, because the, not because of the book, but maybe because of my mental state. I, I have a theory that you can read a lot of classics at the wrong age. I think, for example, personally, I think reading D.H. Lawrence, for example, at a very young age is not advisable. Uh, I, I'm so biased against D.H. Lawrence because I read him when I was very young that I don't, I don't, I can't read him without, without laughing outright. I find some of his passages incredibly funny. And they were not intended to be funny. It was, it, he, writes, he wrote serious books which were not intended to be funny. But I, I read him at the wrong age, and I don't think I got, I got everything out of him that I could have. And how do you know which is the right age? You don't. And I think that's p part of the charm. Interesting. And I'll come back to that or, or related uh, points later. But uh, Didi, I wanted to ask you uh, from one of the many hats you wear, the one of editor uh, for a publishing house, what shapes the sort of decisions you make uh, about what you want to publish and why? I presume that some of them have uh, financial uh, basis. You know that it's going to work. Uh, but overall, what shapes these uh, decisions? For instance, uh, you guys published uh, Tony Joseph. I'm fairly certain when you saw the book, you didn't think that early Indians was going to sell the way it did. No. So uh, uh, Tony was completely out of left field. We published him, uh, full disclosure. Tony was my first boss in journalism. So I, long before I actually joined Juggernaut as a publisher, I looked at an earlier version of what he was writing, and uh, I thought it was worth putting out there. Juggernaut loved it, and uh, they crossed their fingers and took a shot at it. Now, the fact that that book has outsold Chetan Bhagat and outsold Ankur Variku and outsold practically Amit Tripathi is maybe a lesson for Indian publishing. Uh, you have this book. It's on a difficult subject. He's not trying to uh, make things easy for you, nor is he taking a politically correct line. But there are 300,000, 400,000 readers who have really bought the book. In a lot of cases, what we are doing is, yes, OK, we are seizing the moment. Uh, there is a. For example, there's a political battle going on about something. Let's say the farmer's agitation. So we look for somebody who can do a book on that. Or uh, you have a scenario where India is reworking its relationships with the former Soviet Union. I, I mean, the nations that were the former Soviet Union. And we know that, again, there is going to be a committed audience to read that book. So we're looking for somebody to write li like that. And there are some books, I guess, which we do simply because uh, we think uh, we like doing them. Uh, Juggernaut is very broadly a uh, nonfiction house. 
the only fiction we publish is fiction in translation. That's already, we publish Perumal Murugan in English, for example. We publish Jaya Mohan. We publish Minya Min. And we're open to publishing all sorts of translations. Uh, the reason there is, it's already gone through one filter. You know that there, is, there are people in India who love this book, liked it enough to translate it. Uh, the second filter is that we have also discovered that, and this goes back, I guess, to Sarachandra and uh, Munshi Premchand. We've also discovered that uh, Indian audiences relate to, you know, a book which comes from another region of India. The problems sort of make sense to them, so we publish. But uh, we've also discovered that nonfiction, by and large, sells maybe twice as much as fiction, which is, again, something that, uh, uh, you know, if you're a sociologist, you might want to look at this and find out where it's coming from, why it's like that. Uh, part of this, I think, is, you know, Indians are still taught by their parents that you must read the good, useful book before you read the fiction. So, uh, to an extent, even though, a, you know, a book, a, a non-fiction book may not be good or useful, there is less of an issue about picking it up. The second thing is, I think, at least in the last five years, or maybe even longer, you've had a small bunch of people, 25-year-olds, who no longer live with their parents. The parents are somewhere in backwoods UP. The boy is in Bangalore. The girl is in Bombay doing their own thing. And they have a little bit of money to spare. So maybe their tastes are also evolving. Maybe. The single biggest <laughs> takeaway from me, I hate using that word, but anyway. Uh, Takeaway is that nonfiction sells more than fiction. And at some point, I'm hoping that somebody from the audience will have some insight into why. And uh, when we turn it over to you guys. By the way, this is supposed to be a freewheeling conversation. So one of the things we're doing is cutting our own time short and leaving more time for the audience. Uh, two things that uh, Didi brought up, Suresh. One was. Of course, the nonfiction versus fiction in terms of, of selling. The other one was translations. And uh, I'm not as old as you, but uh, yeah, couldn't resist. <laughs> but <laughs> we all grew up uh, actually reading in translation, though we didn't recognize that we were reading in translation, the Dostoevsky's and the Tolstoy's and uh, the Latin American writers, all of them, right? Uh, now that Indian books are being translated from regional languages into English. Uh, given how we grew up, have you started reading those and, and what has that experience been like? Well, I think, I think it's, a, it's a first step and it's an important first step that uh, translations are available in English. Uh, currently, my all-time favorite novelist is uh, Vivek Shanbagh from Karnataka who wrote Kachar Gachar and he's just recently written, his second book has just been released. I, I think he's a magnificent writer and I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to discover more such writers from around the country. The thing about Shanbagh is that he has, he has a lot to say. It's, it, if, if, you, if you think about it, it's, it's, it's a very complex set of uh, circles, but I think Gachar Gachar was about 150 pages, 140 pages. Yeah, he writes, he writes, he brings the world in, in, that, in those many words, in those many pages, what takes maybe a, a lesser writer 600 pages, 500 pages to write. And this serves two purposes. One, of course, it serves to show his class. The other thing is that it, it means that uh, there, is, there is a greater readership for, for, for that. I mean, it's almost a novella. It's, it's, you know, but, but a novella which is rich, I mean, Ian McEwan's Chesil Beach, for example, is, a, is, is, is that kind of a book. It's a, it's, a, it's a strong, you know, death in Venice, that kind of book which, which really uh, says in a few hundred thousand, not hundred thousand, a few thousand words what, what uh, other novels go on and on about. And I think that's an incredible thing. So 
to answer your question, yes, I, th I think Shanbagh would be right up there among, among the novelists uh, anywhere in the world whom I read, and I read him in translation, and he's an Indian writer. So I think, I think it's happening. The, the next step one, one hopes for is that we get translations from, uh, of course, this will leave me out of the loop, but translations in, say, of, of uh, Gachar Gachar and books like that, it, which is originally in Kannada, into, say, Oriya or Bengali or, or, and other Indian languages. I don't know how far ahead we are in this sort of a uh, situation where, where uh, books are translated from one Indian language to the other, and I don't know if there, there's any quality translation like there are now in English. So I think, I, think, I think we're getting there. It's a process, and I think we're getting there, and I'm very happy we're getting there. And I'm also very happy that Didi thinks that, uh, has said that nonfiction sells more because I write nonfiction. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, and, and uh, Suresh said, I don't quite know if this is feasible. I don't quite know if we are getting there. He was talking about translating from one regional language to another. Best person to ask is Didi. Uh, because as a publisher or as, as working with a publisher, do you think that that is a possibility? Do you think that... I mean, obviously the stories travel across languages, uh, but is there is it commercially feasible enough that we will it see that? It's tricky because you simply don't have enough people. For example, I can think of one person, my cousin, who is half Tamil and half Bengali, who could and who's worked in Bengali film, who could conceivably translate someone like Jay Mohan Rao. Perumal Murugan, but I can't think of somebody who could necessarily do it from, you know, Malayalam to Bengali, for example. And uh, the other thing is I suspect the economics doesn't necessarily work in the sense that you wouldn't sell enough and you wouldn't give the writer enough uh, for it to be a useful thing and that's a great, that's a great pity because again, you would uh, access an audience which was, uh, you know, which simply doesn't read much in English, but would instantly respond to your themes, to the stories you're telling. Mm. But uh, I think the lack of translators, lack of good translators from one language to another, maybe it could happen because of movies. You do have this thing where you take a script translated from, it could be from Telugu to Hindi and then maybe from Hindi to Bengali. So at that level, I think you might actually start getting some traction. You know, if a book is being made into a movie and then that movie is being dubbed over or turned into another movie, maybe. But not as things stand right now. Not as things stand, no, I can't see it right now. Uh, both of you in your own ways brought up the thing of uh, translators, the lack of them, and at the same time there's been an efflorence of, of, of Indian writing uh, generally, but of translations themselves. What are the proximate reasons for that? Is it that the books are selling? Is it that the, you know, the Jayakantans, the Perumal Murugans, the Benjamins, uh, the names are known not just in their regions but across the country or is it an increase in the number of people who are capable translators? Is it an economic, uh, is, are there economic reasons? Uh, how do you? No, my, my, my theory is that uh, uh, all these names that you mentioned are selling because they're damn good writers. And, and damn good writers in, 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 the, in the right atmosphere will find the damn good translators. So, which is what I meant when I said earlier that, okay, the, we, the, the first step is that we have the translations in English, which is excellent because now the translators are getting recognition. I mean, Tomb of Sand, which won the International Booker, for example, is, is a book in translation. translation. Translators are getting recognition. When, when a book wins a, a, a prize, even in India, uh, the translator also is recognized and given, given part of the award. So, translator, translation has become respectable. First, writing had to become respectable. That took a number of years. Writing is now respectable. 
translators are becoming respectable. And I think the next step is that uh, with respectability, of course, comes the money and the backing and whatever. So one presumes, I told you I was very young and I'm very optimistic. So one presumes that the next step is that the translators we're talking about from an Indian regional language to another will go through the same process. So that, that process has to, has to start somewhere. Maybe it has started, and, and it's just that I don't know about it because these are not uh, well publicized. Okay, this one is a bit of left field. Uh, Suresh's wife, Dimpy, is a sculptor. Um, and Didi's partner, Nilanjana Roy, who's in the house and pretending not to be, um, is an author, a journalist, a columnist, all of that. I want to ask you guys, what is it like living, I mean, you as creative people also living with creative partners, how does that help? How does that, where, where does, does any dissonance come in? All of that, just what's, what's it like? Well, uh, personally, I, I don't think I'm a creative person. That's, that's, that's left to the, to the novelists and the artists and the sculptors and the painters. I'm, I'm a, I'm a, what's the word? I'm an experienced professional writer who knows where the, where the verb goes. And that's, that's, I think that, that's who I am. The, the creative person, the, the creative sort of component of the feminine <laughs> family is my wife, Dimpy, who's, who's a sculptor, who's, who's a well-known sculptor, works in bronze. And I think we, we tend to influence one another in, in both subtle as well as uh, sort of transparent, obvious ways. And in my case, for example, I, I, I was always, I always followed art. I, I, I like to go to galleries and I like to, and, but, it, but the refinement came because of Dimpy, because of the fact that uh, she, she taught me how to look, she taught me how to appreciate balance and structure. And, and, and I think that, that helped. And I would like to imagine that uh, I, I probably influenced her in certain ways by uh, maybe commenting on her work in progress. I'm not sure, you'll have to ask her that. But the important, important thing I think is that uh, we have, of course we have our arguments, we fight, et cetera, et cetera, but there's, a, there's an easy understanding of the other person's passion. I think that's what I'm looking for. I think, I think if you're passionate about something and if as a couple, both of you are passionate about different things, I think it works very well because then, then each understands the other. And I think, and I'm sure that Limpy's, uh, thinking has uh, influenced the way uh, I think and, and, and work. And, and for, as for my recent book, uh, why don't you write something I might read? It's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a line from her because uh, I've been writing cricket for over four decades and my wife hasn't actually read me, read my cricket or hasn't read a lot of my cricket. And when I ask her, why, why don't you read this book? Why don't you read the Bishan Bedi book? Why don't you read the Tiger Patodi book? And she says, why don't you write something I might read? Hence, I said, okay, let me do this book for her. And we used her work on the cover. So it's, it's, it's a wonderful, uh, it, it worked beautifully for us. Lovely. The bane of cricket writers basically is that they end up being married to spouses who don't read what they write. <laughs> and I'm speaking from experience. Um, Didi? Uh, okay, so Nilanjana and I are both writers and journalists, but we've always worked in completely different areas. And I couldn't write uh, fiction to save my life. And she would not really be interested in a, you know, a lot of the um, science and technology or economics stuff that I am interested in, but uh, we do tend to bounce ideas off each other, and I think she has a very strong sense of uh, the zeitgeist, the what is happening in the country, what is happening in specific places. She's also covered really horrific beats. She's done the sexual violence against women beat in Haryana, which means looking at bodies being pulled out, strangled women being pulled out of 
lakes. She's covered the Delhi riots, which meant, again, burnt bodies being pulled out of sewage canals. So she's done that kind of thing, and she is very connected in that sense to the world at large. And I think, in a sense, she's also been my conscience. There's a certain kind of book I would not edit or commission because I would not be able to justify the decision to her. It doesn't matter what the money uh, part of things would be. Uh, so, uh, in terms of leaving each other alone when you know the other person has a bad deadline or needs to find out, needs to simply put his or her head down and work at something for you know the next three days, I think that's useful, probably true for you, Suresh, as well, that you just say that, okay, fine, the next three days she's not here, as far as I'm concerned, or vice versa. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think I take it from there that we have bounced a lot of stuff off each other, and of course there is the usual thing of you must read this book, which goes both ways. And that was lovely from both of you. Um, Suresh, I, I want to ask you this uh, for quite some time. Um, and, and I want DD to weigh in on the economics of it. And the reason I'm asking this question is because I keep getting asked this a lot. Uh, and I'm the last person you should ask because I haven't written books. Uh, the question is this. Given how uncertain, I don't know of any writer who got rich writing. I mean, the, the, maybe the Chetan Bhagat, so the Amish, uh, Tripathis, or whoever, but as a general rule. So, why do writers write? You're writing, uh, you're working on your next book. Uh, and I remember a story that you told me that involved VVS Lakshman in this exact same question. <laughs> the VVS Lakshman question, I think, was it's quite startling. Uh, he, he was doing this book, uh, his, his uh, uh, autobiography, and he was paid a certain amount, ridiculous amount, of course, by what the standards of normal writers, but he's a VVS Lakshman, so one doesn't argue. And then uh, you're explaining to him the, the whole book publishing business. So he said, how many books do you consider uh, a bestseller? And uh, I, think, I think the publisher was there, somebody was from, and they said, well, maybe 2,000 books. And then he said, uh, well, just, just 2,000 books is a bestseller. Uh, then, and, and with genuine sort of uh, concern in his voice, he said, why do people write books? And the point is there's, there's really no one answer. I mean, the answer can go from the, from the, from the sublime to the ridiculous. I mean, you write books because you have something to say, you write books because that's what you were meant to do, you write books because it's God speaking through you. You can have any of these, book, uh, any of these answers. I remember sitting with Ved Mehta in his apartment in, in New York and he told me, it is not something that I want to do, it is something that I have to do, which is, which is equally valid. And then, and then there's, there's the question of, uh, because, because it, you write a book because you, do, you think it makes you popular, it makes you, uh, well known, maybe not across the country, but certainly well known in your neighborhood. I mean, the, the neighbor who walks his dog by, he tells his wife, you know, that's the guy who wrote the book. That's important to some people too. And then you write books because you think you can make money, and that's where you make the mistake. I, I wrote a book when I'm, uh, when I'm still an active journalist. So book writing is, is a, is a is a secondary thing. I don't even know how many copies my books have sold. I don't know how many, how much money my books have brought in. I have absolutely no clue at all. But it, in, in, in the largest uh, scale of things, it doesn't matter because I have a job, I have a salary, so it does not matter what, whether the uh, you know, book brings in millions or, or, I don't know, tens, I suppose, is the other end of the scale. So, it, so so therefore, one writes for the love of it. One writes because one loves words. One writes because one loves to. One loves combinations of words. One writes because one has something to say that uh, about oneself. Because I think, in a, in a, in a, in the grand scheme of things, 
uh, I would imagine that all books are about the writer, whether he's writing about scientific exploration or going to the moon or whether he's writing about cricket or Vishen Bedi. I think all, all, all books say more about the writer than about anything else. And, and that's, that's fun too. I mean, you write, I mean, the book I wrote recently, is, is, it was just a fun book. I enjoyed it. And I hope that uh, thanks to my, the cover, that the people would buy the book by the cover because of the cover, despite being told all through their school life never to judge a book by the cover. I hope that you know, by, they would judge this book by the cover and buy it. Yeah, uh, Suresh very cleverly got his rant into the title itself. But uh, that aside, did he, uh, Suresh talked about why to write and why not to write from a writer's point of view. From a publisher's point of view, how does it work? I mean, uh, what are the economics and is this the best we can do? The, or what else can we do? The economics is a bit like uh, wildcat prospecting. You publish 20 books, you hope one of them will be a big hit and maybe two or three will do enough to pull in a profit. And uh, the other side of it is that increasingly you have issues about the subjects you publish on because uh, if somebody in the government does not like the author or the views expressed, you can end up with uh, the ED or some other arm of the government coming calling. That's an issue. And uh, you're sort of walking a very thin line because uh, you're you're always trying when you're commissioning at least, as opposed to somebody who comes to you with a bright idea. When you're commissioning, you're always trying to uh, be on a subject which has general interest. And whenever you're looking at a subject which has general interest, of course, there is always a political take on it. And if that political take, uh, if the political take your book takes is different from the political take that the government wants, you can have you can run into a fair amount of trouble, but that said, I think uh, uh, book publishing is still sort of under the radar. We are not; uh, it's not a big enough industry for you know the government to have girded its loins and come after everyone. Uh, they'll deal with the print media first before they come to the publishers. I would suspect. Mm. And uh, also, India being a land of 15 languages, you go under the radar quite frequently simply because somebody is writing in a language that someone else does not understand. So basically, summing up what Suresh said and what Didi said, it's like if you want to write books, don't give up your day job. Uh, yeah. So. Absolutely don't give up your day job. <laughs> Didi, I uh, want to get back to you uh, about something else, actually. We were talking about translations earlier, and you were telling me a funny story, uh, which I thought the audience actually wanted to, uh, I mean, should hear. Yeah. Uh, OK, yeah. So in 1987, I'm floating around in this armpit of the world called the German Democratic Republic. I'm trying to understand something about turbines, engines, ships' engines. I happen to be reading a book written by Eric Maria Remarque, not All Quiet on the Western Front, one of his other books, but he wrote about 25 of them. So I'm, I'm just reading it and my minder, the engineer who's looking after me, because he's, he, he can speak English and he's considered politically reliable, says that looks like an English, uh, that looks like a German name. So I said, hang on, you've never heard of Eric Maria Remark, even though he wrote a 300 million or 500 million bestseller. So he says, no, I've never heard of him. So I said, well, this is who he was. Now, my friend is, actually by East German standards, a very brave man, or he has some connection with the local public library. So he goes to the library and asks the librarian, oh, who is this guy? 
Librarian tells him, see, he was first banned by the Nazis in the 1930s because he was pacifist, etc. And then when the Soviets came in and took over after 1945, they kept with the ban because here he was living in America, living in West Germany, married to fancy uh, movie stars, etc., etc. So they kept the ban on. And then the librarian told him, however, he's banned in, Engl in German, he's not banned in English. I have all his books in translation if you would like to read them. And uh, well, that's, that's the leverage a translation can give you. Obviously, this had slipped through the cracks somewhere that whenever the Soviets or the East Germans put in the ban, they forgot to say that take all his other editions off the shelves as well. But, and of course, within another three years, uh, East Germany ceased to exist. So, but I, I thought it was amazing that you had a highly educated uh, man who was interested in culture and literature, who had never heard of possibly uh, the biggest best-selling writer Germany's ever had. I'm not saying the greatest writer or anything, I'm just saying one of the biggest best-selling writers Germany's ever had. And uh, I thought it was, uh, looking back on it, I think it was a very interesting lesson. Um, I did promise at the beginning that I uh, we would do our best to give you guys more time. So at this point, I think we'll we'll just turn it over to the audience. And uh, you already have a question. Wow. Okay. Uh, Prem, Didi, and Suresh, when I put you guys together, it was also to speak a little bit about cricket. Now, this session is characterized by what you didn't speak about, because Didi has written for Crick Info, as he told me. Prem's a cricket writer, Suresh is a cricket writer. So, from the perspective of someone who really doesn't follow the game, and I'm a minority in India, who would you guys say, for, for Prem and Suresh, is psychologically the most interesting cricketer that you've sort of read about or met or seen. Not the game and things like that, but as a human being. For Didi, who I think is the Kasparov of Indian journalists, who would you rate among your very interesting chess players, psychologically? Uh, one, one is uh, S. Venkatragun, who led, who led India uh, some years ago, who led India in the first two World Cups, actually. Uh, great off-spinner, Tamil Nadu player from here. And uh, I've always fancied, uh, I, I always thought he should, be, he should be writing his autobiography because I think he's one of the most fascinating cricketers to play for India. And not just for the obvious reasons, you know, he was a player, captain, umpire, all that sort of thing. But also the fact that he led India in a test match in Delhi against the West Indies in 74, 75. And in the next test match in oh. Chennai, he was 12th man. He wasn't just dropped, he was 12th man which means he was both dropped and insulted. He had to carry the drinks onto the field. And he continued playing. He's taken a lot of nonsense and he's continued playing. So th th there must be some strength, there must be something about the man. The second man I'll tell you about is Virinda Sevag. Virinda Sevag, of course, he, he hadn't heard of, uh, you know, former Indian cricketers. He, he didn't know who Vinu Mankad was and that sort of thing, that's, that's, that's fine. Uh, but the interesting thing about Sevag is we, we uh, uh, this is a story told by Shane Warne, who said that uh, Virinda Sevag is playing this uh, club match in England with, with an Australian, former Australian cricketer. And uh, the former Australian cricketer was struggling against the bowling because the ball was swinging. It is one of those conditions in England, ball was swinging all over the place. And so uh, he went to Sevag and said, Sevak being a big test cricketer, he said, how do, I, how do I handle this man? He said, don't worry. He'll bowl to me the next over. I'll hit him out of the ground. They'll have to change the ball, and the new ball won't swing as much. And that's exactly what happened. <laughs> Sevak hit him out of the ground. They had to get a new ball. The new ball didn't swing as much. And, and uh, 
the other batsman got big runs. So the, the, it, it takes a certain kind of mind to think along those terms. And, and I mean, I remember once sitting with, with Sevag in a, in a, on a panel like this in Delhi many years ago. And uh, I, was, I was doing the Prem Panika role. I was doing the interviewing. And I said, uh, I asked some question of Sevag. And uh, Sevak said, he looked at me and said, no, Suresh Bhai, I won't answer that question. I'll answer another question. And he answered a question he hadn't been asked. I thought it took a, it, it took a particular kind of personality to think like that. Okay, if I have to pick a name, um, I don't know, I like the stories of flawed genius. Uh, Muhammad Azaruddin. He was, he was blessed by the cricketing gods. He was touched with genius. Uh, on his day, the things... I remember once asking Viv Richards when he was doing a camp for young uh, school children in Bombay. I said, who's your, who's your most, not favorite cricketer, the cricketer you most admire? And I was basically expecting that he would name one of the West Indians or he would name the Aussies whom he actually did respect or maybe the be politically correct and say Sachin Tendulkar or whatever. And this guy said, uh, most respect, admire, Azaruddin. So I said, I mean, why it seemed so off and Azar wasn't playing at the time. And he said, every other batsman, the strokes they play, I can play, and sometimes I can play the, better than them. Azar, I don't know what he does. The ball is there. He does this with his wrist. The ball goes here. The ball is here. He does this. The ball goes there. I have never figured out how he does it. I can't replicate it. And all I can do is sit back and admire. These were Viv Richard's actual words. You think about that man, gifted by the gods, and what he ended up doing, and what, what name he today bears. He's not known for his genius. He's known for his fragility. Pardon? Yeah, the match fixing and, and the corruption and all of that. And you have to wonder what, what went on in his mind. What, what was that thing? So yeah, Didi, your turn. Uh, chess went through a sea change in the way it is played and taught about 20 years ago. The engines, and the engines meaning a computer program which plays good chess, and the databases where you have millions of games to look at, those took over. Now, what you have in the way of a coach now is a guy who's <coughs> looking at very specific issues you might have or your opponent might have and pointing him in those directions rather than trying to find the best move or the sharpest idea, etc. The computers are doing that for you. But uh, your good coach is the guy who's telling you that, listen, you don't know how to handle these positions or your opponent doesn't know how to handle these positions. As a result, you've had an interesting thing happening. Earlier, if you'd taken the world top 10 around 1990, I would have said eight or nine of them were from the Soviet school. They'd been taught by the same coaches. They had the same fixations and the same strengths and weaknesses, even the Kasparovs. The tenth person was Vishwanathan Anand, who didn't have a coach until he hit world number four or something. Uh, if you look at the top ten now, I don't think a single one of them plays like any of the others. Uh, they're all, in that sense, unique uh, chess-playing personalities. Uh, and I mean, three of them are now uh, kids, Indian kids who uh, aren't old enough to have a driving license. So their, their styles might change over the period. But uh, they're from all over the place. And uh, I think the lack of that overlay that there's a coach telling you how to do something actually means your personality has flowered. You're, you've got the material there, you're learning, 
but you're teaching yourself. And maybe there are big blank holes in that entire thing, but uh, it's, uh, you get uh, stylistically very, very different games now. Uh, yes, yes, undoubtedly. Any other questions? That's nice. I decided to turn it over to the audience and the audience is like, oh yeah. Yeah. Another question rega regarding uh, on cricket captains, right? So we've had many, many good uh, captains over the years and all that. So who in your opinion or in your experience is probably the best captain that India didn't have or hasn't Didn't had? have. Didn't have. Mm -hmm. Suresh? Didn't ML Jaisima was one. He was, he was a very fine captain India didn't have. Arupali Prasanna was another. Very fine captain that India didn't have. Possibly, but I'm not sure of this, because in the few times that he did captain substitute sort of thing, he, he, he was original, if nothing else, which was Farooq engineer. But I don't know how, how, how good a captain he would have been over a, over a long five-match series or whatever. But uh, his, his great theory was that he kept changing the bowling constantly because uh, as he told somebody, I, I, I change the bowling according to the batsman. So depending on who's batting, I change the bowling. And that can be quite tedious and uh, irritating for the bowlers. But I think the best, the best captain to answer the question you didn't ask, uh, like a good friend of mine, was possibly, uh, uh, certainly in the recent years, was possibly Anil Kumble. And in, in my All India, um, whatever, 12, All Time India 12, he would probably be the captain. I'll uh, give you a slightly off the ball response. La One of the reasons why is because when, when uh, Arun asked about cricketers, Suresh told the name that I was thinking of, we're in the Seva. I wonder what kind of captain he would have made. I'll tell you why. Uh, you remember when the uh, English came down under Nasser Hussain, and when the team realized that they couldn't win in Indian conditions, they tried to get away with drawing all the matches. Yes. And one of the techniques they used was to get Ashley Giles to bowl two feet outside the leg stump so that you yes. couldn't play shots. So Sachin is out there playing. Uh, Giles was bowling further and further away from the leg stump. And Sachin was letting the ball hit his butt. He was just thinking. And Seva was sitting in the pavilion, talking at the top of his voice. He was saying, look, if he wants to play with his butt, why, why did he carry a bat out to the ground? <laughs> what is, and he didn't say it once. He just, every time Sachin did that, Seva went into a rant. And he said, this is not how you should play that guy. You should teach him a lesson. Just watch. One wicket is going to fall. I'm going to go out there. He's not going to bowl. Exactly that happened. Wicket fell, uh, Seva goes out there, runs around the ball, whacks it in one direction first, runs around the ball the other way, whacks it in the other direction. Ashley Giles has taken off the attack. He thinks differently, even when you look at his batting or when, when you look at the way he, he reads the game. Uh, it's a very pragmatic kind of thing. I have, I have a huge problem with captains who are about we trust the process. What does that even mean? I mean, I trust the process. I tell the boys to go out and have fun. You should take them to, a, to, to, to Disneyland. <laughs> so that kind of thing, yeah. So I, won't, I, I like original thinkers. I like people who think out of the box. And he's one of the contemporary ones who did that. So, Oh, how about Gautam Gambhir? Ah, forget it. When I was younger, I'm not a cricket person by any standards, um, but when I was younger, I used to keep hearing this name, Shanta Rangaswamy. Can you just talk a little bit about women's cricket? Oh. Was that name associated with women's cricket? I don't know. Well, a couple of things. I'll never do that again. Suresh, you start. Yeah, Shanta Rangaswamy was, was a name when uh, 
I was growing up too. I mean, she was a fabulous, fabulous cricketer. I think the first woman cricketer in India to hit a six, which is a big thing those days, made a hundred in a test match. And and uh, I remember we was it? In, I'm not sure. At some at some public gathering, uh, we had invited Shantaranga Swami to speak, and this is my abiding impression of Shanta, who's of course a good friend now. But uh, this is my abiding memory of Shantaranga Swami. We invited her to speak at some function like this, and uh, somebody like you stood up and asked the question, what is the difference between men's cricket and women's cricket? And Shatar Rangaswamy answered, uh, gave an answer which I'll never forget as long as I live. She said, the difference is that the women cricketers don't wear abdomen guards. Um, you can talk a lot about women's cricket, actually. Um, when, when Arun and others refer to me as a cricket journalist, they really should do that in the past tense. I used to do cricket, not anymore. Uh, and that's not the only thing I stopped. I stopped pretty much watching the men's game. But women's cricket, wherever it's happening, I watch. I watch because it's got the same skills, the same techniques, the same uh, qualities. Without the overt machismo, without the, you know, the aggro, the so-called passion that comes out as MCBC, uh, it's both an equally skillful game and it's a much gentler game. And probably because I'm a cricket tragic, I like watching. And, and I also like the fact that the women cricketers uh, are not as constrained when they speak as their male counterparts are. I remember Mithali being asked, who's your favorite uh, Indian men's cricketer? And she said, do you go up to one of the men's cricketers and ask who the favorite women's cricketer is? Why is this a question to me? You know, things like that. Harman Preet Kaur, uh, she came back from, from the World Cup. And uh, at that time, the BCCI had put out a statement saying that you can't have a women's IPL because there won't be crowds. And her, straight away, her response was, who the hell do you think was sitting in the stands when we were playing? <laughs> you know, the, the male cricketers are bound or, or surrounded by this hedge of, there is a, uh, what do you call it, a brand manager, there is a business manager, there is three other kinds of managers. And if you want to talk to them, you have to go through all of these people, get it vetted. Who are you writing for? Is this going to be a cover? What questions are you going to ask? All of that. These guys are open. They they mercifully haven't yet been corrupted by the system. So that's one of those things. Yeah, I had. Yes, I had a question, probably for Devangshu. You know, with artificial intelligence being such a buzz. Any reflections that you have on how it might affect your profession, or even what others might think about how that affects what you do today. Uh, purely in terms of the writing thing, plagiarism has, you know, smooth, easy plagiarism, which is difficult to catch, has become a thing. I was speaking recently to a judge who is the head of a high court, and he said that they have these problems as well. So, uh, where chat GPT is being used by judges to right judgments. And he says it's true for the Supreme Court as well. So uh, that's part one. Part two is it can be enormously useful if you're trying to put together, if you've got the right sort of prompt and you're putting together a s sequence of background uh, news and knowledge around a subject. Uh, if, of course, the problem is the temptation to use that as your, as your writing is a problem. Uh, I think the next stage will really be where you land up, look, uh, non-fiction, uh, which is mostly what I deal with, non-fiction can be fairly well replicated and easily replicated by an AI. Uh, where you're talking fiction, there is a problem. And uh, 
one of the better explanations I've heard for this is that uh, AIs are great at picking a pattern. You don't need life experience to understand how a wave of light works or even to understand how a musical composition works, etc. So uh, they can actually replicate that kind of thing pretty well. They can't handle pure art and they can't handle literature because there you do need the life experience. The reason why Picasso works or Duchamp works, since you mentioned he's one of my favorite boys, he used to play excellent. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, the reason why they work is because there is a separate sensibility there, which an AI can't really reproduce. So I think you'll be, end up with this as a problem, uh, that areas which are non-fiction will to a large extent get taken over. You'll probably have people coming through with acknowledgments that, you know, I put this book together using AI. Uh, yes and no, but to an extent, uh, that's, well, it's, it's really a question of what do you call artificial intelligence? Because, for example, someone like Amazon already uses a version of this. Netflix already uses a version of this. Every time they tell you that, well, you know, you watch this or you downloaded this and you might like to watch this, uh, they are actually using a version of this. You don't think of it as AI because you're used to it. Uh, that is also something that happens. The moment we get used to something, we stop thinking of it as AI. But it is uh, big data, it is AI. And yeah, to an extent, we do look at these things. The issue here is data is always going to be an issue. If you're not, even for Amazon, I'll throw out an economic data point here which most people will not know. Uh, only about 35% of books are actually sold on that platform. The other 65% are physical books sold through retailers and distributors all over the place. So even Amazon does not have a, anything like a complete picture. But yeah, they use a version of this. And yes, I would, certainly I would use it if I thought I could make it work. In, in, my, in my profession, journalism, artificial intelligence might actually help because there's very little evidence of the real intelligence. And uh, by the way, this whole conversation about artificial intelligence is coming up now because of, uh, you know, chat GPT and all the rest of the uh, tools that followed. The 2014 election in the United States, the Washington Post used something called, the, the internal name for it was hieroglyph. It was basically a bot. And it was used to cover all the state level and regional elections, and nobody knew. And since then, they have been using it systematically for creating those kind of news reports that are heavily data-centric which don't deal with emotions. So it's, it's a fact of life. Bloom, Bloomberg uses it, Reuters uses it. Uh, there are Indian media houses right now that are experimenting and have been experimenting for quite a long while. We're trying to figure out how to use it. So it's gonna happen whether we like it or not. Thank you very much. I think uh, the next... I think the ambassador would be... One last question. One last question. Okay. Uh, when, when we come to the subject of the greatest cricket captains of all time, and along with the great Mike Brearley, uh, Imran Khan's name often pops up, you know. And it is a fact that he captained the greatest Pakistan team of all time, and he handled uh, really troublesome characters like Javed Miyadad. Uh, and then this man becomes Prime Minister of Pakistan. <laughs> and he's a total flop. I mean, he takes on the army. He does all the things that, you know, you should not be doing. 
uh, what went wrong? What in your analysis uh, took Imran Khan from a world-beating champion to a complete flop? Here's the thing, it's entirely different from running a team of 12, uh, 11 players, mm -hmm. 12 players, whatever. Uh, the Gujarat model didn't quite translate into all India thing, right? <laughs>